I guess we'll start. Good afternoon. My name is Maude Redberg. I'm the Director of Education with the Easy Life. Thank you so much for joining us on this great weekend, opening weekend, very special. Thank you to the veterans for your service. And thank you to the family and friends of the veterans for your support. So uh, I have a little bit of housekeeping here. I will hopefully not mangle it too much. <laughs> Uh, this program is supported by Humanities Iowa and the National Endowment for the Humanities. The views and opinions expressed by these programs do not necessarily reflect those of Humanities Iowa and the National Endowment for the Humanities. So I did that all from memory, folks. <laughs> okay. It is my pleasure to introduce Terry Van Dorsten. A couple weeks ago, I asked her for some personal stuff um, when I was going to do the introduction, and she kindly sent me this, and I will not alter any of it. She said, Oh, you need to read all this. And I always think the more talented they are, the more humble they are. So I'm going to read it all. Oh, that's nice. So um, Terry Van Dorsten is the first museum manager at the Veterans Memorial Building in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. This is a position she feels fortunate to have, given that she gets to see Grant Wood's memorial window every day. <laughs> uh, part of her role in interpreting the windows for the public and private tours, and she per refers to herself as a Grant Wood enthusiast. I think there's a few of them in this audience today. <laughs> Uh, Terry has been working in the museum field for 28 years, first her, earning her BA from Briarcliff College in Sioux City, Iowa, where she had the opportunity to intern at the Art Institute of Chicago. Yeah, was. <laughs> uh, then she was hooked as a museum professional. Throughout her career, highlights are working at the Des Moines Art Center, finishing her graduate degree at George Washington University, um, contract work for the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian, Nine and a half years at the Cedar Rapids Art Museum. Now the personal stuff. Terry enjoys researching uh, local veterans and documenting their history. She and her husband Chad have their hands full with two energetic boys named Otto and Leo. I love those names. <laughs> uh, the family enjoys cooking together, camping, fishing, and swimming. Gotcha. Uh, Terry's talk today is titled Reflections on the Grantwood Memorial Window. She will talk about the wars that came after the 1928 completion of the window with a focus on the Vietnam War. Please welcome Terry Van Dorsen. Well, thank you for being here on this Sunday morning. I do have some thanks and some credit to give as well. But first, I'm so pleased to know that there are veterans in this room. I would like to thank you for your service to our country, it means so much. I also wanna thank Stacy Gage Peterson, my friend and colleague for the invite to give my talk today, your board of directors and the advisory committee for the whole Vietnam photography exhibit. I also need to give credit to the Figgy Art Museum in Davenport, Iowa. The Figgy holds the digitized scrapbooks that Nan Wood Graham kept, and I pulled a lot of information and research from those Figgy archives, especially the sketchbook, the memorial window. Just a treasure to have these online and available for us Grant Wood enthusiasts to pull through. So that's my, my thanks. Um, I outlined my talk today to discuss the following points. <clears throat> How Grant Wood was involved in the memorial window and the memorial building build. I will also talk about the symbolism around the Grant Wood memorial window. How it was controversial when he came back from Munich, Germany after he had it fabricated. And how it stands the test of time this has been 93 years. It's hard to believe it's that old, but 93 years strong. And it stands up to numerous wars after that. And then I'll conclude with some thoughts and hopefully be around for some questions. I will start out though with a recap of Cedar Rapids happenings in the late 1920s as it relates to the Veterans Memorial Building, who was integral to the construction and the build. How many people have been to the Memorial Building in Cedar Rapids? Oh, super, super, super. Well, I hope this entices you to come visit us. It is a wonderful window and there's so much symbolism in it. I'm just thrilled to share, but do come visit us. 
<laughs> sometime soon. All right. Back in the day, Grant Wood, who I'm, I'm also making assumptions that a lot of us know the Grant Wood history. Okay, good. I'm seeing a lot of nods here. Although what people don't realize all the time is that he was a World War I veteran himself. And he moved with his family after his father passed away in 1911 to Cedar Rapids. Grant Wood attended Washington High School and then he was drafted into the military to serve in World War I. His job was a camouflage, a camouflage artist. And in particular, he was, pardon me, he was camouflaging tanks and helmets. So he served in Washington, DC. Thankfully, as I probably wouldn't be standing before you, he was not shipped off to France, which were his orders after DC, the armistice was signed, and then he was able to come back to Iowa. So waves of years pass, and we fast forward to 1925. Cedar Rapids is a very patriotic city, and it certainly was back then. There were funds available from the government now in 1925, to support the World War I veterans, the Spanish-American War veterans, and the Civil War veterans by making memorials and coliseums, sculptures to celebrate their wars and their part in having America's freedom. So Cedar Rapids was really eager to expand and draw a place create a place in Cedar Rapids to draw folks from Omaha, St. Louis, Minneapolis, Chicago. And these images here are actually the political cartoons for the build of the building. It's going to be a big draw. This little nugget I found, and it, it reminds me of our uh, calendar reminders today, our little Facebook reminder to, yes, I pledge my vote to support the Memorial Hall proposition. It was a big deal because, well, it's in 1925, 26, 27, when the building was going to be built, and the city of Cedar Rapids needed to partially fund the building. And so a bit of the property tax of the good people of Cedar Rapids goes today to funding the building. That was a little spoiler alert, but I know y'all know that. It was knocked out of the park and the building was made, was created. Again, I want to stress that it was the Civil War veterans, the Spanish-American War veterans, and the World War I veterans that were pushing to get the memorial building built. And they went big. It is magnificent. And again, I hope you get a chance to come to Cedar Rapids to enjoy mm -hmm. it sometime. So how was Grant Wood involved in all of this? Again, he was a World War I veteran, and he was a member of the American Legion Hanford Post Number no. 5 that was meant to meet in the Memorial Building after it opened. There is, this is a page from the Honor Roll Book of Lynn County, and it is a 500-page book celebrating the veterans of World War I. So they certainly had the Legionnaires available if they would come and join the American Legion, which Grant Wood did. This is a picture, a detailed image of the flag that was hanging in the Coliseum for Hanford Post Number 5. All right, so at any rate, here's Grant Wood. He's, he knows about the building. His family is going to pay property tax to have it done. And he's also a legionnaire that knows about the funds that were available to build a memorial art piece in the Veterans Memorial Building. There's a picture of Hanford Post. And so he writes to the Veterans Memorial Commission, the city department that I work for, how he could think of no greater local man who is a number one, a veteran of the Great War, 
and number two, an up and coming artist in the town. Won't you please give me the contract for the memorial window? And by goodness, they did. There wasn't, it's interesting, I get this question, was there a jury, was there a call for artists? No, there wasn't. Grantwood advocated for himself. He did have the architects of the building uh, by his side, and that's how he got the commission. And so January, March, he starts making his sketches, thinking out how this is going to be. It was always, the stained glass window was always gonna be in the arc of the Veterans Memorial Building. So he did have that as his campus to work from. He also made a trip to New York City to do some research work, he called it, um, and that was in April of 1927. This is one of the sketches from the sketchbook that's at the Figgy that really shows it near what it it came out to be in completion, in design, if you will. So after he comes back to New York, the Veterans Memorial Commission and the glass artisans needed one-for-one -one drawings of the window for two reasons. One, for the commission to approve it, and two, for the glass artisans to use these, what they call cartoons, to fabricate the work. So Grant Wood and his assistant Arnold Pyle find a place in the Quaker Oats recreation room and they tack the one-for-one -one drawing up. And this is a really fun picture of them from the Cedar Rapids Gazette um, working on that in 1928. This all happened in a relatively quick amount of time. So, to back up, we've got Grant Wood, World War I veteran, local artist, really up and coming. Um, he is under city contract now, and we do this to this day. If it is a project of such and such high dollar, which he was paid $9,000 to do this window, you have to go out for bid to get the best price for the city and the taxpayers. So who won this bid to fabricate the glass is an art glass company in St. Louis called the Emil Fry Stained Glass Artisans. And they are still in business today. So Emil Fry in St. Louis won the bid. He takes the drawings down to St. Louis and gets to know Emil Fry Jr., gets to know Emil Fry, and in those conversations, he understands that there's a branch of Emil Fry in Munich, Germany, that's doing overflow work for St. Louis. Emil Fry Jr. and Grant Wood get really excited about taking the drawings, not just to St. Louis, but to Germany, to have the German artists manufacture them. I recently had a conversation with Aaron Fry um, about the window and about the story, how Grant Wood went down to Germany. Other historians have said he had to go. He actually didn't. The St. Louis artisans can and could back then have given him the clarity and the beauty that he wanted in the window. So at any rate, off he goes to Germany which I'm sure during 1928 was no small feat. I picture them uh, packing these drawings up, they're on a ship, and they're headed to Europe. And he spends about three months there with the German artisans, perfecting his design, and in <clears throat> fact, doing some of the drawings himself. This is Grant Wood with fellow artisans in Munich. Grant Wood also really immersed himself in the culture in Germany. It was a really important trip for him. He doesn't have an opportunity to go to Germany again, if not up till then. And so he paints, these are two examples of paintings that he painted there. Marketplace in Nuremberg, where we see some of the Gothic architecture happening, and Blue House Munich showing a family on the street. Really charming pictures he was doing in 1928. 
he also made a point to go to the museums and the pubs and again, just immersed himself in this German community. There's a book Nanwood Graham wrote about how he just he blended in because he did have German heritage himself and people embraced that. He also went to the Alte Pinnehoek or the Munich National Museum of Art. And what do you know, pictures by Albrecht Dürer were up and Grant Wood was very, very inspired by the Dürer pictures. Dürer has a tendency to self-portrait. Dürer has a tendency to paint very realistically, holding some, he's not holding something in this painting, but holding something that relates to his family or his upbringing, and in the background it would have a landscape also related to his upbringing. Much so, much looking forward to American Gothic and other paintings that he did. This is a self portrait of Grant Wood. And I think it's so charming. It shows the windmill in the background and the rolling hills that I saw on my way here to Dubuque today. You really nailed it. So, He's got the contract for Munich, he goes to Munich, Germany, and he comes back in December. In January, February, March, they install the window, which I'm still trying to wrap my head around because if you have been to Cedar Rapids, we're in the middle of an island on the Cedar River and it's very, very windy and when the snow flies, it, it comes right in the door. So I do need to do further research on how did they install this from December to this final payment in March. At any rate, it's just an interesting moment to be sure. Reflection. So at this point, I want to talk about the symbolism for the window, although I really love to have questions. It helps me um, talk, formulate my talk. Are there any questions right now? Is that building where he's like his drawing? Is that still there? The Quaker Oats building? It is. Yeah. Yes. Quaker Oats and the Crunchberries and Grantwood. Those are Cedar Rapids <laughs> claims to fame, I think. It sure is. I've never been in the recreation room, but I do need to get a tour over there. Yes, it is, Stacy. If you have the original drawing, because it won't, who doesn't? What's that? The, the original drawing that you showed? Oh, yes. You have pieces of that, do you know? Or I do. Okay. <laughs> I'll be talking about that in a little bit. Okay, so. What my Cedar Rapids friend Jeannie was talking about are the one for one drawings that he hung at Quaker Oats and took to Germany. They were on permanent loan to the Cedar Rapids Art Museum from the 1970s until June of this past year. We got them home at the building, so I'm excited to have those and help interpret the window even more. In fact, that's a great segue, thank you. Here's one of the drawings. <laughs> one for one of the American Revolutionary War soldier. So this is the point where I'd like to talk about the symbolism that Grant Wood put into the window. If you're standing in the lobby, admiring and taking in the piece, there is what I call the horseshoe around the window. And he's put in symbolism into this horseshoe. I begin on the left with the Navy insignia. He worked in the Navy, the Army, and the Marine Corps insignia into the horseshoe of the window. So here we have the Navy, like you are, American Revolutionary Soldier. The Navy goes all the way up, up, up to the keystone piece of our female figure. Then it begins the Army. And the Army trails down to the right. And you see he's, he's not only done the branches, Army branch, but he's also put in the division insignia, which makes it more personal to the veteran piece. 
taking in the window, finding that connection. Army goes all the way down to the medic symbol, the Red Cross. And then it begins the United States Marine Corps. Wow. <laughs> the Marine Corps branches are interesting to us Grantland enthusiasts on the window because in the drawings, the one for one drawings he did, he actually added the division insignia, whereas it didn't translate to the actual window. Why? Yet to be discovered. And here's some close-ups of that. It was on the drawing, but not on the window. Even closer, so much detail into the drawings, but very different when it translates to stained glass. Other symbolism in the window is our Gigantic, she's about 16 feet tall. Lady of Peace. Grant would also refer to her as the Republic, so America herself. She is holding the laurel wreath of victory and the palm branch of peace. Manwood Graham, Grantwood's beloved sister, was the model for the Lady of Peace, the Republic, in the memorial window, and she was also, as I'm sure other Grantwood enthusiasts in the room know, she was the model for American Gothic as well. I had to include this beautiful picture of Nan um, because she was so angry that she looked like a spinster <laughs> in American Gothic. Here is our Nan in Portrait of Nan that is actually for sale in Lincoln, Nebraska these days. Another piece of symbolism he's put in are the great wars fought up until 1928 when the window was done. So you have the American Revolutionary Soldier, the War of 1812, the War with Mexico, Civil War, Spanish-American War, and World War I. Are there any questions? Oh, why is the one with bare feet? That is the A number one question I get. I wish I had a bell. <laughs> Every time I do the talk, I'm glad you asked. So there are a couple theories out there about our War of 1812 cannoneer, if you will. He does stick out because of his bare chest. When you're, with, when you're in front of the window, it just glows white, glows that skin color. Our latest theory, I have this beautiful volunteer working with me on our library collection, and she was an art teacher, I'm sorry, a history teacher, and she taught the War of 1812. And when she saw it, she said, gosh, Terry, I think that is a pirate from this naval war. Isn't it possible that this could be one of Andrew Jackson's hires aboard Jean Lafitte's ship doing his job as a cannoneer. And I said, I don't know, so, so. yes, it certainly could not be. It would, it would fit because we've done research on the Navy uniforms. And nowhere can we find a Navy, U.S. Navy <laughs> uniformed personnel with a hat such as this, with the red hat and the beanie. And if you get close to the window, when you come to Cedar Rapids, you can see he has wisped hair in front, very unusual, and he's, he doesn't have his shoes on. And yeah, no shirt. And no shirt. It was a hot, it was a hot profession. I will tell you that. Someone else shared with me that when his, his job being the cannoneer, and he's holding a ramrod, mm -hmm. and he's jamming the mm -hmm. gunpowder in for someone to then light the fuse and win the battle. So I've heard that that was a very hot, hot job. Mm -hmm. 
what was that? 1812. 1812. And Mabel. Mabel. The others are others. Infantry, and maybe they're all infantry except that one. That's true. They all are in the army, huh. as far as we can tell. Grant Wood was a private in the army. I'm so glad you brought this up. And he was very passionate to research and make, although I'm still on the hook now about Jean Lafitte's pirate, yeah. that these soldiers be dressed in the uniform of private. Private. Yes, because he was a private and he wanted to give a nod to the fellow privates, the grunts who were doing all the work. Good to know. Any more questions? The other wars were, what were the other wars? Uh, American Revolutionary War, I'll just go through them all. War of 1812, the War with Mexico, Civil War, Spanish American War, and World War I. Okay, so I'm going to recap just a little here. So he got the commission, went to Munich to travel, was artistically inspired by what he saw in Munich, he worked all the symbolism to, to the design, and it truly is a memorial for all veterans. So why would it have been controversial? And it certainly was. When Grant would return from Germany, it is said that he returned to a very angry community, that he had gone to Germany a mere 10 years later after World War I, where our sons, our grandsons, fought and died, and now you're hiring the enemy to pay for a memorial piece to veterans at the Veterans Memorial Building? How dare he? I can really, and I put myself in that context. Um, one can see why a scuttlebutt was created. And that scuttlebutt was created by, or I shouldn't say created, it was led by the DAR the Daughters of the American Revolution, and in Cedar Rapids, that would have been the Ashley chapter, which is still uh, vibrant today. Grant Wood did get his, um, <laughs> his own by painting Daughters of Revolution in, I believe, 1931 or 32. It was shortly after. Um, this created a national sensation I don't know how familiar you are with the DAR, but they are a very, very um, influential political and funding group that has been around since the American Revolution. And so on a national scale, people wanted to see this, although the DAR was very, how dare he do this? So Cedar Rapids at the time was about 47,000 people. Grantwood was 37 years old. Meaning, he knew exactly who these ladies were. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, kind of, I'm always looking and trying to find the connections. And I think I'm onto something with this old photograph from the Gazette of the Daughters of Union veterans presenting a plaque at the memorial building. It's, it's just, it's so close to our DAR. So the satire, I'll give you some symbolism in this, it's just too fun. Um, in the background of our Daughters of Revolution is a famous painting called George Washington Crossing the Delaware, and that was really one of their logos, their mottos, if not pride and joy. Well, in fact, George Washington Crossing the Delaware was painted by a German artist who outfitted his models on the line. The lace is from Germany, <coughs> and the brooch is something he picked up for his mother while he was in Germany. There is symbolism with the teacup, being that is very Asian looking, and absolutely the hook. There's um, 
an art history book that calls it the hook. Like she's holding this teapot and it almost looks like a like a chicken foot, just <laughs> grabbing the tea water. The scuttlebutt was so intense that Grant Wood wanted and was planning on a dedication of the memorial window. But in fact, it wasn't dedicated until after he passed in 1955. That's how very serious it, it was against him and the manufacture of the window in Germany. So I'm thankful he went to Munich. This window really stands the test of time. And when you are able to see it in person, it is an absolute jewel, a treasure. I've called it magnificent on many, many occasions. You may have said this already, but what are the dimensions of the window? It is 22 feet tall and 24 feet wide. I don't think I can say that. I was talking about the Lady of Peace being 16 feet, but if you can imagine, it being 24 feet tall. You really have to go to the building to appreciate it, because there's a 2,000 seat Coliseum opposite of this window. It's amazing. It is. Oh, when the sun shines on it, it just, it's a jewel. It's an absolute jewel. Take a big sip of water here. So, Grant Wood, World War I veteran, World War I ended in 1919 when the armistice was signed, and yet there are numerous wars that come after it that he couldn't depict. They pass away and pour it into his face. So I thought, for this talk, given you have this beautiful exhibit, um, AP photography around the Vietnam War. I thought it'd be interesting to think about what would those soldiers look like if he had the chance to create them after 1928. So I went through the archives at the Veterans Memorial Museum and I came up with this gentleman for World War II. He was a private when he started out. Mac McLeod. We have my probably 600 things on him for our archive, mostly photographs. He was very um, good in keeping his photographs and recording his journey. He served during World War II from 1942 to 1945, wow. and he was one of the units that helped to liberate France and here in the U.S. with his band of brothers in France. His family actually helped him out and fed them food. So I thought Earl would be a good one to represent World War II. And then there was the Korean War. Very shortly after World War II, I don't think um, the history books, if you hadn't lived through it, um, give justice to just how, how quick 1945, 1946, and then 1950 were into this with Korea into this for this soldier that I'm going to discuss. His name is Private Donald Lewis Baker. He was in Company H, 2nd Battalion of the 24th Infantry Regiment. That was attached to the 25th Infantry Regiment. Um, the 24th and the 25th were the Black African American units when the Korean War started. The United States military was segregated. By 1951, they desegregated the military. So I wanted to show you his likeliness. And he was killed in action on September 6, 1950. And the Cedar Rapids Museum has his archive because his remains were recently recovered in 2018, and he's laid to rest in one of our hmm. cemeteries, Old Hill Cemetery. So that's how the Cedar Rapids connection and his story came to us. And then came the Vietnam War, which was, as 
you're experiencing, well, as you're remembering, <laughs> and experiencing again with the exhibit more than a decade long made battles. So again, these are pictures from the collection. A lot of the archives that I get are portraits, which I thought was interesting to include. Sergeant Boyle here, um, although all of our soldiers in the window are holding a weapon, so I'll show you that one as well. And so on and so forth. And how would you choose? I, I don't know. How would how would Grant Wood choose which like the nest? I'll leave you with this one because in Korean War and the Vietnam War, there were females as well. So by goodness, they could be on the window themselves. So that is pretty much where I leave you with room for some questions. Just how the window stands the test of time and that this window was a major part of Grant Wood's artistic journey. And had he not gone to Germany and had he not caused the controversy, um, I don't know, would it have stood the test of time today? Again, thank you veterans for your service. Thanks for being here today. Yes, sir. Um, I'm interested in what, what logistics are in place for the protection of the window, building shifts, and all of that. Oh, that's a great question. Um, the building itself is protected from the water, <coughs> the flooding that happens um, pretty much on a yearly basis. So those flood protections help protect the window. I'll tell you how. There is a generator on the island now. It's very subtle. It, the architect worked it into the historic buildings, but it's above the thousand year floodplain. The generator's there in the event that the power of the building is shut off, the pumps can't run, the air conditioning can't run, and so we have heat and humidity and bad things happening there when there's water in the building. So that's really important to the window to keep it uh, stabilized, climate stabilized. There's also a giant flood door down underground. There's a tunnel that connects to a parking garage. Great idea for parking. <laughs> Bad idea for water because it floods first and then the water finds the lowest spot in the building. So we've tested it actually and only tested it after 2008 when it was installed. But then in 2016, we had another water event. And we had five and a half feet of flood on the right side of the flood door and only about three inches in the basement. It was terrific. We recently had very, very high winds. The derecho, I don't know how much it affected um, the Buchan area, but it, it was a very, very destructive storm for Cedar Rapids. Thankfully, um, I had just had the window cleaned and stabilized some heat fractures we had been seeing. And so I think that's a great help, you know, to have someone on site looking at it, caring for it, calling the glass artisans when need be um, to have it stabilized so that in the event there's 130 mile an hour winds going by your window, it's safe. And thank goodness it was it was fine. I really held my breath that day when I walked into the building, and it was it was standing. It was great. And the glass is of quality enough that it's not sagging at all, um, as you know some do over time. It sagged after the 2008 flood. Okay. Um, I need the visual. Well, I'll use this one. So the window around that horseshoe is flanked by an oak brace that basically goes behind the window. 
Um, and that the oak race goes all the way to the floor. So what happened in 2008 is the water gets everywhere and it's seeped in behind and found that oak race. The oak expanded and contracted, expanded and contracted through some mold and it also created this terrain effect on the exterior protective of the window and the interior protection glass and water droplets began to form mm. and then the lead fittings began to corrode, gravity takes hold and started bringing it down. So that's the sagging that we saw. Fast forward to 2020, 2021, um, the glass artisans had suggested that the interior protecting come off because we were seeing that going given the heat and the cold of Iowa was being trapped in these protective glasses. So we did take a, a long debate and a lot of research later. We did take the interior off so that it could breathe. And it's interesting, the World War I soldier, throughout the day you can you know it'll, it'll pop and move. It's, it's pretty fascinating. Mm. But now it can breathe. Who knew glass needed to breathe? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So does he work in glass again? He does not work in glass again. He had only worked a couple times that I was aware of before this. There was a charming lamp at the Cedar Rapids Art Museum with peacocks and stained glass. There's a star lamp, and there's some glass work at the Turner Mortuary in Cedar Rapids, and that's about it. No more. That's right. What you've touched on and what's really emphasizing, I'm sure, here is that if it weren't for the memorial window, we wouldn't know of Grant Wood now because um, his style at that time was impressionistic and going nowhere as far as career. And he hadn't gone to, to Munich and see the artists of the Renaissance and change the style of that, we wouldn't know him at this point. As this window was really what it led into the style that made him famous. So. It's so true. And Randy, the more time I spend with the window, and I get to see it every day, pinch me, um, the more I see and agree, and historians argued this back and forth, that if he hadn't had this trip to Germany, would he have come to this? And I, I absolutely agree with these arguing historians now, because in the window, our soldiers, which he helped paint the faces, I see the gazing eyes, Right? Pursed lips, stoic faces, and they're they're all holding something that is near and dear to them, that is their job, that is their livelihood. And so I I absolutely believe well, now the, Northern, the, the bridge is there. Artists, he had already seen probably at the Louvre, but it wasn't until he saw Mimeling and then the windows be done in Munich that really inspired him to, to go to the, the style. Absolutely. And the realistic puppy trees, the quintessential grant wood. Yes. Sure, can you comment on the public hours that you have for uh, both viewing the window and the other exhibits you have there? Can oh, sure. you comment on the exhibit? Because currently it's Vietnam, right? It's Korea. Oh, it's Korea. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, you did get to see the Vietnam exhibit. That was good. Um, we are open Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. It also says by special appointment, and there's a phone number there, which I am happy to give tours anytime outside of those 8.30 to 4.30 hours because it's my fortune to have my job to help, you know, <laughs> interpret the building and the window. And, you know, yeah. like Eastern Iowa. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. We have four galleries right now open. One is de devoted to the Korean War. One is devoted to the older things, I call it the Civil War, Spanish-American War, World War I veterans, American Legion Hanford Post, and American Legion Ponta Musan Post, number 451. It's a joy to help interpret all this for Cedar Rapids. So you have artifacts as well as Yes, and honestly, the collection, which is about 4,000 things, are mostly artifacts. Um, 
things they carry, uniforms, memorabilia, and loads of multi photographs and archival material. And do you accept things from outside of Cedar Rapids, or it's all people from Cedar Rapids? I have, if the Gold Star Museum in Des Moines does not want it. Yeah, Our mission yeah. encompasses Eastern Iowa on a broad scale for <laughs> a reason. It's just so fluid right now. And if you have Cedar Rapids ties, and then that fits our mission. So Des Moines and Cedar Rapids, other things would be given. Yes, they hold the Iowa Veterans Archive at the Gold Star Museum. Gold Star. Yeah, it's fantastic. Boy, if you've never get there, it's on Camp Dodge in Johnston. It's immense. Yes, ma'am. Cindy has. And she has something she'd like to show us that's very near and dear to her. Oh, work. super! Well, I so come on up. I'm one of a fiber artist in the guild, and uh, Fran Ford released one pattern that he could use for one hooking or painting with wool. And this is what I did. <laughs> so, I'll have to go to the hospital. It's a Oh, that's terrific. <laughs> <Here's me. laughs> Can you come farther into the room? So we oh, sure. Get, um, we'll have this um, <laughs> recorded for all time. This is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my God. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if I can have a favorite, appraisal is one of my favorite. After the window. <laughs> 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 it would be nice to have the mural. That you use that after the page. Yes. The Cedar Rapids Art Museum would like to partner with us on uh, miniature window. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a decal, but a yeah. decorative yeah. window. Yeah. Piece or Christmas ornament. Mm -hmm. And we're definitely going to get some postcards going. It's going to time. The Veterans Memorial Commission owns copyright. To the window so now that we have all these lovely digitized images it's just a step away from merchandise i suppose right. thoughtful merchandise mm -hmm. are there any other questions thank you, thank you. Thank you.